protected John on the island called Patmos while he was in the spirit on the Lord's day. The Bible says he saw the Lord. And he didn't see a bruised up, broken down, battered and shattered Jesus. He saw a man whose eyes were like the flame of fire, whose hair was white as wool, whose feet were like bronze as refined by fire. That's glowing. Whose voice was like the sound of many waters. And out of his mouth proceeded a double-edged sword. And when John saw him, the Bible says he fell as one dead. He couldn't even stand. Well, I don't believe that whole falling stuff. Why do people fall when they're prayed for? Well, Jesus, when he appeared to John, he couldn't stand. There's something about the glory of God that you're not able to stand at times. There's a waiting pressure of God's glory that makes oftentimes it unable to bear, especially with these human bodies. The Bible says in 1, Corinthians, 1 Chronicles chapter 5 that when the priests gave, um, when, they, uh, when they honored the temple and inaugurated the temple, the first temple, that the glory of the Lord so filled the temple that the priests couldn't stand to minister. What does that mean if they couldn't stand? It means they fell. They couldn't stand the pressure and power of the presence of the glory of God. The Bible says in Isaiah, Isaiah 6, when he saw the Lord high and lifted up and the train of his robe was filling the temple, he too said, woe is me, I'm a man of unclean lips. There's a holy God. We're not gathered here. Thousands of years after Jesus came and uh, visited this earth, died and rose again, we're not gathered here paying tribute to his carcass, buried away in a tomb. We're gathered here because God is holy, God is alive, and God is still moving on the earth today. This is not dead religion. This isn't philosophy. This isn't theory. This isn't some antiquated textbook. This is the living Jesus Christ at work in his people. And God has a plan for England. God has a plan for London. God is going to visit this nation one more time before the end comes and you're going to be a part of it in Jesus name I saw the Lord his eyes were like a flame of fire John falls on the ground Jesus picks him up and says hey picks him up one hand I am the living one I was dead but behold I now live and I live forevermore and I hold the keys of death hell and the grave that means the devil doesn't get to decide your destiny any longer. That means the devil doesn't get to determine when you die. That means the devil has lost his legal right over your life, your soul, your spirit, and your body. When you come to Jesus, you have transferred yourself out of the domain of darkness and into the dominion of Jesus Christ, and the devil has no jurisdiction in that territory. You are born again, not born below, born from above, seated in heavenly places is in that same position of authority and power in Christ Jesus so that you now have the dominion on the earth. The devil doesn't have dominion over you. You have dominion over the devil. We're going to get into that tonight. If you have your Bibles, turn to Luke chapter 15. I want to preach on the gospel. Amen. There's nothing like the gospel. Nothing like the gospel. And I know that in my generation, preachers especially, there's a lot of ministers that they shy away from the gospel because it's too simple. Too simple. We like the more complex things. We like to get into the more theoretically challenging doctrines. And then they get up and preach and nobody understands what the heck they're saying. <laughs> they're just talking from deadheads to other deadheads. And it's just dead religion. And there's, I'm not against, I study, I'm theologically approved. I, I've gone to Bible college. I study to show myself approved, a workman who need not be ashamed. I'm not mocking study. But I am saying is that when you come before people, it shouldn't be a show of strength of how doctrinally challenging you can be. It shouldn't be a show of theological muscles where we have theological gymnastics because there's hurting people. Behind every pew, there's a broken heart. There's a sick body. There's a failing marriage. And I didn't come to England to try and just challenge you to think a little different, to intellectually challenge your... I didn't come to challenge nothing. I came to proclaim. I came to declare. I came to declare that if you are in any 
prison pit that the enemy has buried you in, you can call on the name of Jesus, and he said, I will hear you and answer you, pull you up out of the miry clay, put your feet on a rock to stay so that you come out in victory, in freedom. God has a plan designed in the gospel to bring you out into freedom. That if you have anxiety tonight, God can give you a peace that surpasses all understanding. If you're sick in body tonight, God can put the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead to quicken your mortal body and give you health for sickness. If you came in here bound mentally tonight, God can break the chains and the strongholds mentally that the devil's last on around your mind so that you can leave here free in body, free in mind, free in spirit. If you're, if you're someone whose marriage is on the brinks of collapse, the Bible says God is a mighty restorer. He's a mighty healer. He's a redeemer. He can redeem the years that the locusts have eaten. It doesn't matter what the devil's done to you or your family. You're one prayer away from him turning the tables on the devil and what the man, enemy meant for evil. God can turn it for your good. You understand, this is the type of preaching that shook England in the 1800s, 1700s. John Wesley, Charles Wesley, George Whitefield, they shook England and the 13 colonies furthermore. And they didn't shake it because they were coming in with nice, cute, turn your Bibles to the book of Mark. They didn't come there. They came with power. There was a burden and an urgency in their spirit. And that's how I came to England. There's an urgency in my spirit. There's people that need, to get, that need to get saved. There's people that need to be delivered. There's some people, the devil's reign of terror has been so taxing on their life that they feel like they're in a pool, drowning with no way out. But I've come to announce there is a way out. Jesus said, I am the way. I am the truth. And I am the life. Nobody gets to the Father except by me. So I tell you, it's going to start with you tonight. God's going to touch you tonight. In such a way, you'll never be the same again. How can I be so confident in that assertion? Because that was me in 2012. My friend here, she grew up with me. She knows how I was when I got saved the first few months. I was a mess. I was a drug addict, heavy drug addict. And she came to college with me. She saw I, I was a drug addict. I did hard drugs and I did soft drugs. And I did a lot of alcohol and partying and clubbing. And I developed something when I was 13 years old called obsessive compulsive disorder. And don't ever hear of OCD? Yeah, OCD is a mental generalized anxiety disorder. It affects many people. There's at least 3% of the United States of America that has confessed to have it. Many do not confess to have it. I was not one of those that confessed to have it because it's very, it's shaming. I mean, you don't like it. It's uh, the thoughts you have, not normal. The feelings you feel, not normal. They're irrational. OCD is characterized by intrusive thoughts that compel you to do things you don't want to do or else something horrible is going to happen. Everybody say spirit of fear. Say spirit of fear. Yeah, that's what a spirit of fear does. The Bible calls it a spirit of fear that leads to bondage. Leads you to bondage. Feels like you're in handcuffs. Feels like you're not free to do what you want to do. Feels like you're literally doomed to destruction because of the vile thoughts that plague and flood your mind. And in the natural, there's no way out. You can try pills. You can try shock therapy. You can try all types of mental anxiety, coping tips. You know what's great about the gospel and about Jesus Christ? Jesus didn't preach coping mechanisms. Jesus did not preach coping mechanisms. Jesus was not a mental health expert. I have to go through this because I, the Church of Canada and, and England is pretty similar. It's pretty similar, especially where I'm from in Quebec. It's the most secularized province in the entirety of the North Americas. Less than 1% of people attend church on Sunday morning. Less than 1%. And so, and there's a reason why. The, the preaching, it's don't blame the people. This, this whole like wave of preachers that say the people are hard, they're hard to reach. And they're not hard. The problem has always been sin. The solution has always been the gospel. The people have never been easier to reach. The harvest is still ripe. It's still ready to be plucked up. It's not the people. It's the preaching that changes. It's not the people and it's not God. Because God, Jesus Christ, is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. So it's not Jesus. He's immutable, unchangeable, and not open to interpretation. 
Can't reinterpret. He's not open for renovation. I'm not trying to appeal to a new generation with some cool woke Jesus with skinny jeans that are ripped and a soy latte in his hand. Hey, guys, I just want to talk about love and the philosophy of love today. We're just going to get it. No, that's neutered religion. No power. The Bible says they hold to a form of godliness, but they have denied the power that is able to set men free. But I'm here to tell you tonight, Zechariah 4, 6, it doesn't matter if man's given up on you. It doesn't matter if man has closed your case. The Bible says it's not by power. It's not by the force of might, but by my spirit, I can do all things in your life. And so here I am, OCD, messed up. Taking pills they used to give patients with psychosis. If you don't mind just bumping me up a little bit on the mic just to help me out. We got four more services, amen? Thank you so much. On uh, medication, they'd give patients with psychosis, and it did me no good. I looked like an extra on The Walking Dead. You ever watch that? I looked like a zombie. <laughs> Drew coming out. My, it was not good. It shuts your brain off. Because, you know... Psychology deals with the psyche of a man. And psyche is soul, the soul of a man. And so when you... Oh, thank you, sweet lady. He that gives a cup of cold water to a righteous man. <clears throat> psyche is the soul of a man. The soul of a man. And psychology, if you study it, it deals with the biology... And the, the, soul, the, the, the mind, the will, the volition, the, the mental faculty of men. But there's another dimension in life that's beyond psychology, beyond biology, and that's spirit. Man is essentially a spirit. We have a soul, and we live in a body. But we are spirit beings. Whether you know it or not, you have a spirit, an eternal spirit, that originally was created in the image of God. That's the thing. Remember when God told Adam, if you eat of that fruit, you'll die? Did Adam die when he ate the fruit? No, he didn't. He lived on 960 years after that. So he didn't die with his body. But what died? His spirit. The very thing that was in the likeness of God perished the moment he rebelled against God. That's why Jesus had to come. Romans chapter 5, verse 17. The Bible says, through one man's sin, death entered the world, and death spread to all men. But much more now, through the obedience of the one man, Jesus Christ, shall we receive the gift of righteousness, everybody say righteousness, and become heirs of the grace of life, everybody say the grace of life, that we might now reign in life by Christ Jesus, hallelujah, notice how it doesn't say we're all losers, how many of you know we're all, we're all wretched, deprived human things, no we're not, it's nowhere found in the Bible. And the more you down-talk yourself like that, the more you disgrace the finished work of the cross. And I know it sounds humble and it sounds cute, but it's not Bible. And I want to be Bible. I promise you this weekend we are going to start in the Bible, we are going to stay in the Bible, and we are going to finish in the Bible. Because the Bible is where the power is at. The gospel is where the power is at. Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for in it is the power of God unto salvation, saving all that believe. Not ashamed of the gospel. So you have to understand you're a spirit man and there's a spiritual realm. Ephesians chapter 6 verse 12, the Bible says, we wrestle not against flesh and blood. You think it's your boss, but it's not. You think it's the prime minister, but it's not. You think it's the WHO, but it's not. You think it's the WEF, but it's not. You think it's some, some human being that's orchestrating the evil on this earth. It's not. There are spiritual forces of wickedness at work in heavenly places. And the world is deprived in that fight against those spirits and against the dark world, the hidden world, the spiritual realm. But you know who's not deprived? The church. The Bible says the weapons of our warfare are not carnal to fight flesh and blood. If I want to fight, I don't pick up a sword. I don't pick up a gun. I don't pick up a, a bomb. If I want to fight, I, I get on my knees. Hallelujah. If I want to fight, I lift my hands up in praise to my God. Because the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. They are mighty through God for the pulling down of strongholds. 
Yes, there are wicked forces that work in this world. But bless God, Jesus said, I'm going to build my church and the gates of Hades can try all they want. The devil can throw his best work at the church. The church will advance. The church will progress. The church will move forward unhindered whether the devil likes it or not. Can you say amen? So, though we wrestle not against flesh and blood, we do wrestle. Everybody say, I do wrestle. Yeah, there's a fight. Life's not a fun fair. Life is fight. Life is not fun fair. Life is warfare. There's a fight. Everybody say, there's a fight. The fight is against the adversary. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 7. The Bible says, be sober. Meaning, don't get drunk. You got people that come here all the time. Can I smoke marijuana? The Bible doesn't say anything about it. Are you sober? No. Then don't do it. <laughs> be sober. Be sober, the Bible says, because why should you be sober? You know, one of the ways the Roman Empire fell was because they were all opioid addicts. They were all opioid addicts. So what happened? The, the enemy mobilized people and they came in and destroyed the Roman Empire. Totally destroyed it because they were all drunk and high into wild orgies and all kinds of wicked things. So in the same vein, if you're in the, in the spiritual realm, if you're not sober-minded, you're on, the Bible also, also says it in another translation, be on the alert. If you're not on the alert and you're just thinking life's going to be flowers and daisies and you're just going to frolic off while God just goes out and clears the opposition in your way, that's not how it works. You have a responsibility. You have um, the decision to make to believe God and fight the good fight of faith if you're going to lay hold of the things Jesus paid a high price for you to have. Be sober. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Two things to notice there. One, he is not a roaring lion. He is like a roaring lion. He's really just a pussycat with a microphone. With his claws declawed de and his fangs defanged. How do we know that? Colossians 2.14. The Bible says Jesus disarmed principalities and powers. And he made a public show of the devil openly. Having triumphed over him at the cross of Calvary. Yeah, the devil's not some victorious foe. He's a defeated devil. He's a chump that got his rear end booted 2,000 years ago, and he's never recovered from the humiliation of Calvary that he suffered. Jesus Christ is king of kings, and the devil is defeated. Can you say amen? amen. <laughs> Bible says he's like a roaring lion, but he's just a, a mouse with a microphone. Then it says, seeking whom he may devour. That tells you he can't just devour everybody. Shows you there's people that are undevourable and there's people that aren't devourable. Everybody shout, I'm undevourable. undevourable. Yeah, and you can tell. There was a guy, in um, a preacher I follow, and he's a powerful minister. And he said one time, this boy, not really boy, he's probably like in his 20s. He went to try and cast out a devil out of someone. And he used the name of Jesus, but the devil just looked at him and slapped him in the face. And he ran back and he, was, he went up to his pastor. He said, Pastor, Pastor David, why did, why did that devil slap me in the face? But when you went to cast out, it left. Why did it slap me? And he looked at him and he said, because you have a face that looks like it can be slapped. <laughs> and he wasn't trying to make fun of him or anything. He wasn't saying he was ugly. It had nothing to do with that. He was just pointing out a very important fact. That when you understand who you are in Christ and whose you are in Christ, when you understand that you've been made to be the head and not the tail, that the devil's under your feet, that he has no legal right to stay over your head. We're not on an even, pl even playing field. The devil is under my feet and there to stay. When you understand that, you start to look differently. You start to walk differently. You start to minister differently. You don't minister like you're a shy, a shy timid cat. You understand at those things there's a bold lie in nature that rises up on the inside of you that no matter the devil that stands on in your way you walk on like a holy ghost bulldozer flattening everything that would try to oppose and stand in your way can you say amen you have to understand these things the bible says my people are destroyed because of what not because the devil's big it doesn't say my people are sick because the devil's big and he's extra angry with that individual it doesn't say that says, my people are destroyed because they have a lack of knowledge. The Bible says, 
Through the wisdom of a man, his face is bold, with, is, is bold to shine. It's in the book of Ecclesiastes. Through the wisdom of a man's heart, his face becomes bold and shining. So when you start to get into the word and start to see who you are in Christ, very important. The Bible says in James 1, the word is like a mirror. When you look in a natural mirror, what do you see? Who you are in your flesh. When you look in the spiritual mirror, who do you see? Who you are in Christ. And when you start to look in the mirror and start to study all the intricacies of what God did through Christ in the gospel in your life, that you're not the old sinner saved by grace. I'm not a sinner saved by grace. I was a sinner. I got saved by grace. Now I'm the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. And if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. The old is passed away. Behold, everything becomes new. You start to see yourself like that. Then, when you're walking down the streets of London, you'll start to see people that have demons growling. Yeah. I don't check under my bed to see whether the devil's there. The devil checks under his bed to see whether I'm there. <laughs> you think I'm going to give him any? Brother, you need to pray the devil's really on our Pray. Go study the book of Acts. Not one prayer is given towards the devil. Not one prayer. You go to some church services, every prayer is about the devil. Satan, we bind you right now. Why are we going to take up our time binding? What bind? You want to bind? Preach the gospel. You want to bind? Cast the light of the gospel out of your mouth. The light shines in darkness, and darkness can't do anything to stop it. You want to take over in a nation? Shine the light. Jesus said, ye are the light. And a city set on a hill that cannot be hidden. But nobody lights a lamp. And puts it under a bed. But he puts it on a lampstand. So that it can give light to everyone that is in the house. And that's been my prayer coming into this nation. That God's going to have an impartation of boldness by the Holy Ghost. Into the people sitting in this place. That you're not going to be a coward Christian. Hiding away. Worrying about people. Of what they'll think about your faith. But you're going to rise up in this last day. In these last hours. Filled with the Holy Ghost and fire. To announce to a new generation. That Jesus is alive and he lives on the inside of me. Come on, if you're with me tonight, London, put your hands together and shout hallelujah. Amen. So I'm on all these pills and medication. And then finally, in 2012, about the month of May, I'm in my bedroom down to 108 pounds. Because I couldn't swallow and digest. Anxiety messed up my stomach. Anything I'd eat, I'd throw up. I tried eating banana. I'd throw it up. Banana is digested food already. <laughs> There's no digesting required. It's already digested. And I threw up. Did the toast, apples, all that stuff. Threw it all up. So finally, about two, three weeks, living like that. I... Um, in my bed, I'm having a heart palpitation because of an anxiety attack. Anyone ever have a panic attack? You know what it feels like. The honest people lifted their hand, <laughs> the rest of the people. But it's okay. God will set you free from that. That's why he sent me here. Freely you have received, freely give. What God does for one, he desires to do through that one. So I was in my bedroom, palpitations, sweating. I'm thinking, oh, well, I'm going to go meet Jesus now. So I might as well get right with him. I slipped off my bed, I got on my knees, and I began to pray a very simple prayer. So simple, it's only three words. God doesn't care about your Shakespeare language. God doesn't care about you having the most eloquent King James type of prayers, these and thous and all arounds. God just wants faith. God doesn't care if you're black. God doesn't care if you're white. God doesn't care if you're Spanish. God doesn't care if you're Chinese. God only sees two colors, faith and unbelief. The only two colors God sees. And if you have faith, the Bible says he's no respecter of persons, but God is a respecter of faith. How do I know that? Thousands of people were touching Jesus that day. 
And then one woman with an issue of blood for 12 years had spent all that she had at the hands of many physicians, and she did not grow better. She only grew worse in her affliction, but when she heard about Jesus, she pressed through the crowd, and she said to herself, if I may just touch the hem of his garment, I know I will be made well. The Bible says she pressed through the crowd, touched the hem of his garment, and she got what she said, because faith expresses itself through the mouth. I'm not just going to think faith. I'm going to speak faith. I'm putting the demand on the anointing tonight. I'm putting the demand on the power of God tonight. I'm not leaving here the same way I came. I'm leaving here with breakthrough in my spirit. I'm leaving here healed. I'm leaving here restored. I'm leaving here free and free forever and free at last in Jesus' name. Devil's losing my losing me for good. So she touched the hem of his garment and instantly flow of her blood was seized, and Jesus turned to her and said, Thy faith has made thee whole. There were a lot of people touching Jesus that day. Only one got that miracle. Oh, you see, it's because Jesus is sovereign, and he, no, he didn't even know. You understand, when he laid aside his glory, he forfeited his omniscience for a while. He was not all-knowing while he was in that body. He had to operate by the gifts of the Holy Spirit. He had to operate by the word of knowledge. He had to operate by the word of wisdom. He didn't know everything. If he knew everything, why would he say, who touched me? Who touched me? He asked because he didn't know who touched him. This whole notion of God's miracle program is based upon his sovereignty is hogwash. It's not biblical. Most of the miracles Jesus did had nothing to do with what he wanted. It was people that were touching him with faith. They, the Bible says in Mark 3, many touched the hem of his garment, and all that touched it were made well of whatever affliction they had. Stop pinning the responsibility on God when God has already pinned the responsibility of faith on you. Oh, Lord, we're waiting for you to heal us. Waiting. He's like, it's 2,000 years later, baby. You just need to get off that religious traditional program, pull up a seat to the table of God that he's already prepared for you, and start to feast on the goodness of the Lord while you're yet in the land of the living. The Bible says every promise of God is yes and amen in Christ. How many of you know when we die, that's when the real healing happens? Really? Where is that in the Bible? Because you're not going to be healed when you go to heaven. You understand that? It's bad theology. You're not going to be healed when you go to heaven. This earthly tent will be done away with. And a new celestial tent will be given to us. A tent that is incorruptible and immortal. I'm not going to have this body in heaven. I'm going to have abs again. I'm going to have blue eyes. I'm going to fly. I'm not going to have this body in heaven. It's going to be a new body. So this whole, like, you'll, you'll, heal, you'll get healed when you get to heaven. When we cross across the pearly gates and get in, then finally he'll say, son, be healed. And that's not going to happen. We're going to have a new body. Healing's not for the next life. Healing's for the nasty now and now. The promises of God are not for the sweet by and by. The promises of God are for the nasty now and now. We're not going to need healing in heaven because there ain't no sickness there. Is there any sickness in heaven? What did Jesus pray? Pray that my will be done where? As it is where? Oh, interesting. See, when you start to think through doctrine, you realize a lot of what you hear is garbage. See how that works? You start to actually think and use your noggin to logically come to conclusions via the word of God. You start to realize, wow, much of what I've been taught on YouTube is not quite right. Yeah, because most of these YouTube guys don't have any degree in nothing. <laughs> they don't have any weight in the spirit. They have no authority to speak on th certain things. But I have 100,000 subs. Great. Jesus had 12 disciples. You think you're more qualified than him? <laughs> I have 150,000 subs. I feel like I can call out preachers now. You can't. You live in your parents' basement, for goodness sakes. You're 48 years old. You can't call nothing out. <laughs> you have this movement now. You have these, these councils that are being formed of YouTube preachers that have big followings, and they're councils now. And they are the moderators of the body of Christ now. You have no weight in the spirit. You understand in the healing, voice of healing revivals that you couldn't even get ordained unless you had at least three quality and proven miracles? Not like the sniffles. Talking about raising the dead or stage four cancer and proven with doctor's note. 
You couldn't even get ordained or licensed under the voice of healing. Now you have these self-proclaimed, self-accredited, self-licensed people speaking on things that they know nothing of. Desiring to be teachers, they speak on things they do not know and they're persuading people away from the Word instead of into the Word to try and make it more palatable for people. I didn't need a palatable Michelina frozen dinner type of gospel served to me when I was at the depravity in the pits of hell. I needed the raw gospel spoken to me without trimming, without trying to water it down so it doesn't offend. The gospel is an offense. It's an offense to those that are perishing. But we don't lower the thermostat for those that don't even want to go anyways. You raise it up. The standard is still holiness. The standard is still cleanness. The standard is still repentance. The standard is still what it's always been. We don't lower it down to suit a culture today. We raise it up and the gospel will be an offense to them that are perishing. But to those that are the called, hallelujah, to those that are called, it is the power unto salvation to the Jew and then to the Greek. That's where I was at. Bound by OCD in my living room, in my bedroom. I get off on my floor and I just said three words. Jesus, save me. That was it. Jesus, save me. Three words. Instantly. Everybody say instantly. It was like electricity hit me from the top of my head to the soles of my feet. And I was, I was right there like a blanket just came on me. And I began to weep. And that's when I had the regeneration of the spirit. What we call born again. Where God removed the heart of stone from my heart. And he gave me a new heart. And what I couldn't do, I, you know, I had a love for God. I believed in God, but I was never born again. That's where a lot of people are deceived. They love God. They think they love God. They have a, a perceived love for God, but they're not born again. Jesus didn't say, and those who love God will inherit my kingdom. You must be born again. You must be born again. Has there ever been a time where you stood before a holy God publicly and received him into your heart, where there was a total transformation in your desires, your agenda, your plans, your purpose, everything changed. Where Christianity was not some dull, dusty religion, but there was a thrill, an excitement, an adventure that came into your spirit. Where it wasn't you have to drag yourself to church because of a religious conscience that you just wanted to soothe for one more week, thinking that if you go to church enough times throughout life, God or St. Peter is going to allow you into the heavenly kingdom. God's not impressed with your attendance at church. God's not impressed with whatever you've done or not done. God looks at one thing, and that is, have you received Christ into your heart? John 1, the Bible says, he came to his own, and his own received them not. But as many as did receive Jesus, to them gave he the power to become children of God. In the moments of time coming, I'm going to give you an invitation. Maybe you've never had this opportunity afforded you. But I'm going to give you an invitation to stand with me publicly at this altar, where you're going to pray a prayer with me of repentance, turning away from this world, receiving Christ into your heart. And what God did for me in that bedroom, God will do for you. He'll take your old heart of stone, filled with hatred, filled with envy, filled with jealousy, filled with bitterness, filled with every evil thing that we all had, all sinned, all had fallen short of the glory of God. And there was not one way out. There was nobody who did good, the Bible says. We had all strayed away and together become corrupt and abominable. But God laid the sin of us all on Jesus Christ so that we wouldn't have to go to a devil's hell, but that we can receive a heaven, a prepared place for a prepared people. I'm going to give you an invitation in the moments to come, but finishing my story, I got saved right then and there. It wasn't until months later. Because all I heard growing up was, Jesus can forgive you of sin and you'll go to heaven. Great. That means my faith was limited. That's as far as my faith could go. You can never go beyond your faith. You'll rise or fall to the level of your faith. And how does faith come? By hearing. Hearing what? The word of God, not the opinions of men. The word of God. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. You could never rise higher 
then your level of faith and your level of faith is changeable. That's the good news. You might have come in here with no faith. God will give you faith as you hear the word tonight. You may have come in here with little faith and a lot of struggle. God will fill your heart this weekend with the word of God so that it will build your faith reservoir up where you'll have an overflow of Bible faith, the type of faith that gets you to look at a nine-foot giant in the eye and say, what did you say? I'll take your head off and feed your body to the birds of the air. The type of faith that gets you to look at a cancer and say, what is that you're doing to my son's body, to my wife's body, to my father's body? And you'll go in and lay hands on them with the anointing oil of God, and you'll deliver them and raise them up from that sick bed. It's the type of faith that gets you to feel like a a, a 10 foot, 20 foot giant in the spirit. The type of faith that allow you to look at that circumstance that the world has told you is impossible and you'll look at it dead in the eye and say not with God, for with God all things are possible to him that believes. Can you say amen? amen? That faith is coming in your heart this weekend in Jesus name. I said that faith is coming in your heart this weekend in the name of Jesus Christ. Doubt is being cleared out of your heart. Anxiety is being cleared out of your heart. And the faith of God to triumph in all things is residing in you in Jesus' name. So I'm two months later, three months, I still have OCD. Still having panic attacks. Then finally, I'm listening to an evangelist preach out of Isaiah 53. Never read it before. And as he's preaching, he starts to say from verse 4, Jesus bore our sicknesses and carried our pains. It's a prophecy written 800 years before Christ that was fulfilled when Christ came, but Isaiah has seen in the Spirit. And he says, He himself bore my sickness and carried our pains. Oh, that's great. Never heard that before. Then it says, He was pierced through for our sins. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was laid upon Him. And by His stripes... Ye are healed. Whoa, I said. And then I remember thinking, well, that was the Old Testament. We're not in that testament anymore. Wouldn't it have been great if we were? But that, I guess that promise is not for me. I had no understanding. See, faith is built on your understanding of the Word of God. When you don't understand the Word of God, guess what? You won't have the faith required to receive God's best. But when you have an understanding of the Word of God, you start to build yourself up in that holy faith And you realize what actually belongs to you already. Things that you may have been praying for for decades. Not even realize they're in your heavenly account already. There's a lot of people who pray for things that are already in their heavenly account. That you have to make a withdrawal from. Imagine if I had 100 million pounds in my bank account. And all I did was sit on the corner of the London Square and just panhandled. What are you doing? Oh, believe in God for lunch today. You have 100 million pounds in your account. What are you believing for what? You should be providing lunch. Oh, I know I do, but you know what? Got to ask, right? There's some things you, there's two types of prayers God will not answer. You want to listen to this. Number one, God will not answer the prayer where you're asking him to do something he already told you to do. Lord, we pray that you would save England. Go ye therefore into all the world and preach the gospel. (laughs) Lord, I just pray that you would save my Aunt Sue. Just have you picked up your phone and told her about Jesus yet? You're asking him to do something he told you to do. God, send your angels. It don't work that way. Don't work that way. There's a biblical blueprint to have revival. It's actually not that hard. Isn't that wonderful? People overcomplicate revival. I have revival everywhere I go. And it's because I don't make this, Lord, we just pray you'd visit us this way. He's already here. You can't get the Holy Ghost closer than He is right now. The Bible says, Ye are the temple of the Holy Ghost. God dwells amongst His people. He said, I don't want to dwell in an ark. I don't want to dwell in a box where there's just nice designs behind a veil. That's why when Jesus hung on that cross, He gave out that final cry, Tetelestai, it is finished, where the veil was torn from top to bottom. And when it happened, the Holy Ghost came out of the ark and He came into the church and the church has been empowered by that Spirit not junior Holy Ghost, the same Holy Ghost that raised Christ from the dead, dwelling amongst His people. Know ye not that ye are the temple of the Holy Spirit, and God's Spirit dwells in you. Lord, we just pray that you'd, you'd be in this place. That he's here. 
Can't get closer than where he is right now. Right here. Right here. John 7, 37. Out of your belly shall flow rivers of living water. This spake he of the Holy Ghost. Oh, I just feel like you're so far, Lord. Would you come near? He can't get closer. He's not upon you. He's not around you. He is in you. Greater is he that lives in you than he that is in the world. So you can't pray for something you already have and then, or for God to do something he's already done. And then number two, you can't pray for something that God already said you have it. You get saved, but then every day you're saying, Lord, I pray, save me. You already have it. You've got to believe it. You've got to receive it by faith. Same goes with healing. So I'm in my couch now, and I'm listening to this evangelist preach. I say, well, that's the Old Testament. But then he flipped over to Matthew chapter 8, New Testament. Everybody say New Testament. New Testament. It says, at evening they brought to Jesus all that were sick with various diseases and torments, and he cast out the spirits with his word and healed all that were sick, that it might be fulfilled. And get this, Matthew by the Spirit connects that, his healing ministry, with exactly what Isaiah said in Isaiah 53. That it might be fulfilled that he himself bore our sicknesses and carried our pains. Well, I said that was Jesus. If Jesus should come back in flesh and touch my body, I will gladly receive his healing power and I will receive the freedom of the cross. But that's not how Jesus operates. What God did through Jesus in the flesh, through Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, he does in this day and age through his word. What God, let me say it again because I feel it flew over some people's heads. What God did through Jesus in the flesh In Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, he continues to do today via his word. Psalm 107, 20. He sent his word and it healed them and delivered them from all their destruction. I just just pray that you'll just lay hands on me at the end of the service. Can you get over the preaching right now? I I just need you to lay hands on me. He sent his word. His word is where the anointing is at. The Holy Ghost can't confirm anything outside of the Word. See, that's the problem with our generation. Is that oftentimes there's this microwave McDonald's religion. Where it's, I want to get healed quick, get rich quick, get delivered quick, get everything quick. Jesus didn't even do it that way. You understand Matthew 4.23 it says, And he taught in all their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom. And then he healed every manner of disease and every manner of of, uh, sickness amongst the people. So there's a divine blueprint as to how God operates. He's not Oprah walking out. And you get a car and you get healed. And he doesn't do that. He first has to have the word sown in the heart. On the fertile soil of the heart. And then it produces a supernatural harvest. It's the incorruptible seed of the word of God that anything it touches, whatever corruption has seeped in, it reverses the corruption and brings it back to full restoration. Hallelujah. I prophesy in the mighty name of Jesus Christ tonight, whatever the devil has corrupted in your mind and your body, it's getting in reverse because God's going to reverse the irreversible things this weekend. God is going to change the unchangeable and do the impossible by his spirit. In Jesus' name. Come on, if you believe that, put your hands together, England. So there I was, saying that was Jesus. But then the evangelist flipped over to 1 Peter 2.24. And it says, He Himself, Jesus, bore our sins in His body, that we being dead to sin might live to righteousness, by whose stripes ye were healed. Not future anymore, past tense. Ye were healed. Instantly, I had a vision of Jesus tied to a whipping pole with his knees on the ground, blood all over his face. And he looked to me. And he was taking lashes on his back. And he looked to me and said, I did this so you could be made whole. And from the top of my head to the soles of my feet, I felt electricity running through my body. Never felt that before. So I know this stuff ain't fake. This ain't fake. I received as fact what the Bible preaches, that what Jesus did and accomplished, and when I received this fact by faith, I had the experience. People want the experience without the faith. People want the experience without the faith. You got to have the faith before you get the experience. You know, I'll believe it when I see it. You'll never see it. Thomas. 
Unless I put my hand in his side and my fingers in his hands, I'll never believe. Jesus shows up. Hey, Thomas, come on. Big mouth, huh? <laughs> and Thomas probably took a step back and said, I take it back. No, 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 Jesus said, put it in. Come on, see. I'm alive. And he said, blessed are you that believe though you've never seen. Thomas, you believe because you saw. But blessed are those that believe though they've never seen. You're blessed tonight. Because though you've never seen Jesus, you got up, you could have been anywhere on a Friday night. London's a very busy city. But you came into the house of God. And I know it might be an elementary school, but the house of God is wherever the people of God gather. You came to the house of God to sit under the word of God. And those that put their trust in the Lord shall never be disappointed. God's not going to disappoint you tonight. You're going to leave here with your miracle package in hand, shouting, I got just what I wanted from the Lord. Hallelujah. That was in 2012. I went back to the doctor, and the doctor tried to diagnose me, did all that stuff. He's like, well, look, if you, don't feel, if you feel better, nothing more I can do for you. You don't have to come back. I said, doctor, with all due respect, you didn't do anything for me in the first place. It was Jesus that healed me. It was Jesus that delivered my mind. And I'm going to spend the rest of my lifetime telling a new generation that our God's not a philosophy. He is the ruling and reigning king. And he's one prayer away from him touching your mind, touching your body, saving you with his power. That whatever the devil's done to you or your family, God will flip the table around and bring about a supernatural. Holy Ghost, turn around in your life. Come on, if you believe that, one more time. Put those anointed hands together. Give God a mighty shout. I was going to get to my text, but we'll do it tomorrow. But I did quote about 100 scriptures, so don't worry. I feel the anointing right now. If you'll just stand, Liz. If you'll just lift your hands wherever you're at. And you can open up your mouth and pray. It's not illegal. We're not in Kazakhstan or something. <laughs> in the name of Jesus Christ, thank you, Father, for your anointing. Thank you for your power at work in people's lives here tonight. Thank you, Lord, that you're touching the beautiful people of England. Ha, ha, ha. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Come right here. Lift both your hands. John. In the name of Jesus Christ, the anointing of God comes on you right now. Spirit of the Lord. There it is. Ha, ha. <laughs> Jesus. I'll loose the anointing in you. There it is. There it is. Fill it. Fire of God. More, 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 more. More, more. Kereba ste pariana maha. There it is. Jesus. Jesus. There it is. Jesus. Jesus. Keshte pariana maha. Free. Prozondia raga zeteriana moho. The name of Jesus. The fire of the Holy Spirit runs right through you. Jesus' name. Ki uro zekanaba. My friend in a nice plaid gray jacket. Right behind you, if you mind just tapping her hand. Come, come, come. Lord's going to touch your body. Jesus' name. What's wrong with you? What is that? I had an autoimmune okay. disorder. So when it was not reversing, I was left with it. So I don't believe that there's you believe Jesus can heal your body? Amen. Let me pray for you. Lift your hands. Close your eyes. In the name of Jesus Christ. I loose the healing power of God in your body right now. Command your withered body and withered hand to be made strong. And restored even now. In Jesus' name. There it is. Shoots right through you. By faith, I call it done. By faith, I call it done. By faith. Command your hand to be restored. 
Jesus' name. As whole as the other, as whole as the other, loosed. <laughs>